the aftermath of Japan's devastating earthquake, Deirdre, investors have been trying to figure out which companies stand to gain, not least from changes in energy policy. Then, of course, there is the turmoil in the Middle East and the questions it raises about U.S. energy security. One company that has caught the market's eye is Range Resources. Shares of this Texas-based oil and gas company surged 14 percent of the week after Japan's disaster and are now up some 17 percent for the year, more than five times as much as the S&P 500. With us this morning is the CEO of Range, John Pinkerton. He's in Pittsburgh. John, so glad you could be with us. I gather you were in a bit of a nasty tra traffic accident or near to it and had to fight a traffic jam to get to the studio. Uh, let me start our interview with this question. Do you believe the Japanese quake really dims the prospects for nuclear power here in the United States? Well, Eric, that, that's a great question. And I think obviously our hearts and uh, our prayers go out to the Japanese people about the, uh, the tsunami and the earthquake. The, uh, the issue on the uh, nuclear power is uh, I think we've got a lot to, to try to learn here from this accident. Uh, but I think clearly uh, the, the issues over safety and the environmental impacts are going to be devastating. And I think it's, it's just going to take a lot of time uh, to sort all that out. But I think the bottom line is I think uh, nuclear is going to have a, a, hard, a hard road to uh, row here for a, for a while while we well, try investors, to figure this as out. you know John as you know investors want to believe that gas companies like yours are going to benefit as a result do you believe that well I think uh, I think a lot of things uh, one when you look at what's going on in the Middle East and what's happening in Japan I think you've got to really look at energy security and the good thing is companies like ours range resources we found uh, and discovered the Marcella shell up in Pennsylvania here and it could be the you know first or second or third largest gas field in the world so now we've got clean abundant safe energy right here in the US that we can use to fuel our uh, economy create jobs um, so I think you know those are the things I think that people are trying to figure out but the good news is is that we've got plenty of natural gas we've got as much natural gas in the US as Saudi Arabia has oil okay we've heard some of those figures and we're showing our viewers pictures of this Marcella shale deposit and some of the other shale deposits in the United States right now and we know they contain an enormous amount of gas there are there is some dispute as to how and whether we should be extracting all of it but there is a bit of a disconnect that I want to explore with you. The performance of some oil and gas stocks in the past week and the performance of natural gas. Natural gas isn't going anywhere. In fact, over the past few weeks, natural gas futures prices have come down. They're still hovering around that $4 per million BTUs. At what point, and this is critical for an energy company like yours, how much more demand must we see in order for there to be a shift in the supply-demand balance to drive those gas prices back up, make companies like yours more profitable? Eric, that, that, that's a great question. I think you hit it right on the, on the you hit the nail right up by the hammer. The, uh, there's been a revolution in our business. We have found an enormous amount of gas using this new technology. It's just going to take a while for the, uh, for, to, to work through the system. The good news is, is that we can be profitable at $4 uh, per MCF for gas. So at the bottom line is that, that we can be profitable, we can make uh, good money for our shareholders, great returns. At the same time, the consumers really benefit because they get an energy source that's, that's roughly a quarter uh, in terms of price compared to crude oil. John, you look at what's happened since that Japanese quake. Have you reevaluated any of your development plans, let's say, or uh, any of your demand projections in light of all the discussion about changes in energy policy and of course everything that's happening in the Middle East. Well, I, I've said, you know, numerous times uh, and on your station, you know, that, that I think the next 10 or 20 years is going to be the golden era of natural gas. And, uh, and when you look at the U.S. in particular, uh, over 90 percent of our transportation system is run off uh, crude oil. And, and roughly half of our electric generation is run on coal. And I think that's just going to that's going to switch. And I think natural gas is going to be the primary beneficiary of that. It's cleaner, it's abundant, um, and it's cheaper. And at the end of the day, you know, we're all producing BTUs. I think our BTUs are environmentally very sensitive and also uh, they're cheaper. So I think at the end of the day, natural gas will win. Uh, last month, when you, your company sold some $900 million in Barnett shale properties, you said you were considering the sale of an additional two to $250 million. Are you still thinking about that, or has that equation changed? No, we, you know, we, again, you know, 
on a relative sense, we're an $8 billion market cap company. So we're in the energy business, we're a relatively small company. And we have found probably the largest gas field in the United States. So we're going to need all the capital we can find to help develop that. So we're going to continue over time to sell some of the lower end assets that we own to help fuel our growth in the Marcellus. John, you haven't been especially specific about how you're going to spend the $2 billion in debt financing you just raised. Is it going to go to this gas deposit? Are you going to be dumping uh, the majority of it into the Marcellus shale? How do you plan to spend it? Yeah, Eric, you're, you're exactly right. We Again, we have found a great gas field. It works at very, very low natural gas prices. So we think the right thing for our shareholders is to put as much capital as we can prudently in, on a uh, regulated basis into the Marcellus because we think that is what's going to drive our share value over time. John, give us a sense of, of what kind of capex that's going to require over the next year, say 2012, 2013. Well, we're looking at spending roughly a billion, billion four this year, and and probably a billion four next year, and then we'll ramp it up after that. So we're, you know, it, it's going to be it's going to be significant. But the good news is, with the Barnett sale, uh, the sale of the Barnett Shell assets, along with our cash flow and the hedges we've got in place, we'll be able to fund that, and uh, we think we'll be cash flow neutral by 2013. John, quick question before we go. The New York Governor Andrew Cuomo is considering lifting a ban on hydrofracking here in New York State. Does that make you interested in acquiring some of those Marcellus Shale leases across the Pennsylvania border and in New York? Um, uh, not really, Eric. We, we own a huge position here in, in uh, Pennsylvania. We own uh, leases uh, about 1.3 million acres, of which about 700,000 of it is what we think is in the fair way of the play. That's a huge position for a company our size. So we're going to stick to our knitting and just focus on the assets we have today. There, there are other companies that will pursue those other leases up in New York. John, thanks for joining us and helping us with the story. We'll continue to follow the future of U.S. energy in light of what happened in Japan. And